this first meeting of the mystical Bible. We're going to start this meeting with a practice that some of you may not be acquainted with, and that's a silence. We're just going to close our eyes, and in that silence we're going to rest in the Word of God for a minute or two. If you'll join me, please. back with me to a day now called the 25th of December in which a babe was born and on that day there was an innkeeper who just prior to this birth had said to this traveling couple I'm sorry we don't have room for you in this inn I'd like you to see that the human race, in a sense, is that innkeeper and has been saying to this child, we do not have room for you in this inn. Oh, but by the way, we do have a little spot for you. We'll try to make it warm and comfortable. It's a stable. And we'll put you there. You'll probably be all right. And so that's where the babe was born. Now, if you remember, they didn't have television or newspapers. The world hadn't heard about this event. And in spite of the fact that the innkeeper was too busy, too occupied with his commerce, in spite of the fact that this little event was completely unknown to the world, something happened to draw to it the wise men from the East. There was a quality in this child, and this quality attracted to it gifts. And we are told that when this quality is in us, it attracts to us the gifts of the wise men. And that is the promise of the Christ message for all who have ears to hear and eyes to see. There is a quality in man undetected by most, but present, dormant, waiting for recognition, and to discover this quality, to nourish it, to let it rise within us, to let it become the dominant force in our lives, was the purpose of the life of Jesus in that three-year ministry when he demonstrated the power of this inequality. And then to teach us not to personalize him, not to worship the man, not to be content and say, there goes a great man to make graven images, not to be idolaters. He said, if you believe on me, the works that I do ye shall do, and greater works shall ye do. And as we look around us today, we say, where are the greater works? Where are they? Wherever you look, you see the opposite. You see war, you see famine, you see poverty, you see ignorance, you see fear. You see disease, you see death, you see destruction. Is it possible that we are still innkeepers who are too busy? Is it possible we are still letting that child remain in the manger? As we look around us, we see that the world has tried many antidotes to remove its problems. We have tried science. We have tried God. We have tried psychiatry. We have tried pills. We've tried standing on our heads. We've tried theosophy, theology, philosophy, you name it. The world has tried everything they can think of except one thing. They have not tried the message that Jesus taught. 
They have tried many concepts of it, but the pure, immaculate message remains vital, throbbing, waiting still to be recognized and taken out of the manger. And that's the purpose of every mystical movement to bring to us the word not interpreted, not a word that has passed through an intellect and comes out a word through a glass darkly, but the word of God direct, the experience of God within you. This has ever been the function of the mystic and it will be the function of the mystic in your midst until the child is out of the manger. Now then, a mystic is going to be, in our work here, one who, to some degree, has been able to find the living word of God within himself, who has been able to commune with the Father, who has been able to experience the presence of God within. Now this is not a unique quality reserved for any one individual or any group or any sect. This is the quality demonstrated by the seers, the prophets, the masters, the leaders. And it is this quality which has brought to us the great scriptures of the world. Now then, before a word becomes a word in the Bible, something happens to give that word a divine quality. And when you recognize that divine quality in the word, you understand why it's in the Bible. Now let's look at what happens to make a Bible possible. You no doubt have bunked into many people who are under the impression that the Bible is merely a compilation of stories collected by some sixty-odd men, some of them fanatical dreamers, some of them zealots, some fanatics, all with great purpose, no doubt, but by and large, human beings. Human beings who had a message they wished to impart, so they scribbled it down. And although it's very difficult at this moment to retrace these particular men who are responsible for the book we're studying, except in part, we do know this. There is a river within each individual. There is a river of life, a river of silence, a river which carries the voice of God. And when that voice speaks within the prophet, within the seer, within the individual who has attuned himself to that voice, we have the word of God. And that word becomes the Bible. And that becomes a sacred repository of the living word of God as given through individuals such as Moses, Je Jeremiah, Zechariah, Jesus, John, Paul, and so forth. It was not their doctrine that they expounded, but rather the doctrine of the Father within. And this is what made it a Bible. And this is what made it the living waters. And a Bible, then, is a compendium of living waters. And we are told to imbibe those living waters to drink them in. For drinking these living waters ye shall never thirst again. Now most of us have made a study of the Bible. Through whatever religion you have practiced, whatever metaphysical form you have followed, no doubt you know the Bible backwards. But so does a good part of the English-speaking world so does a good part of the foreign-speaking world, and yet we're always at war, we're always fighting disease, 
We're always fighting one another. We're always wondering what is my mission in life? Where do I go from here? What's it all about? In spite of the word, in spite of the word that is in the Bible, we still do not know the very purpose of life. How many do you know who can say, I can tell you what it's all about. I can tell you why we're here and what we're to do and what our destiny is. Very few, if any. And so you see, we have an intellectual understanding of the Bible, but deeper, so deep perhaps, that we have not received this inner meaning this esoteric meaning, this mystical meaning. We have superficially understood the words because they're English words. But when you say, I and the Father are one, what are you saying? When you say, greater is he that is within you than he that walks the earth, what are you saying? And so on, these are words and we understand them, we say. But you see, when you understand them, you live them. And when you live them, you walk under grace. And when you walk under grace, you walk without fear. You walk with the certainty that where I am, the Father is. Wheresoever I stand is holy ground. The Father goeth before me. The crooked places aren't there because the Father is there. And until your heart is light with this assurance, the confidence that wherever you are, the presence of God is, then the child is still in the manger. And it's good to know it. It's good to know that there is a way to let this Christ rise. It's good to know that there is a method. And it's all right within our grasp in this little book waiting for us to recognize it, to assimilate it, to believe in it, and then to walk forth and do likewise. If you believe on me the works that I do, ye shall do, and greater works shall ye do, is a covenant. It isn't a question of is it possible. It's a question of when will you do it? When will you accept the truth of it? And so mystical Bible, we hope, will be an intensive course for these next ten weeks after this, in which we'll skip through the Gospels, the four, the Synoptics, and then into John. We'll go into Paul. We'll go into the Acts. We'll study the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, We'll carefully analyze the parables. We'll dip into Isaiah in the Old Testament. What we're going to do is try not only to reach an intellectual understanding of the Word of God as expressed here, but we are going to try to reach that state of consciousness in which the Spirit of God within you communes with you so that you receive not the truth from a speaker on a rostrum, but the truth from the living God within yourself. If we can reach the point where this to you becomes a reality, you will understand the golden thread of truth that has been reported through the centuries by every mystic. And you will see that you were never excluded from the truth of God. Now let's take another moment of silence and then let's begin our work.
they all begin on the same foot. I'm merely going to read a few lines here of that happening of the marriage at Cana in Galilee. We want to all become acquainted with every detail of this. You'll discover that because it has been selected by John to be the first miracle in his gospel, it is setting a pace, it is establishing a precedent, it is targeting for us the very essence of the mission of Jesus. Now then, let's read it first, just to see what's there, in case you haven't read it lately. And then we're going to dip into it very carefully. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, than that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Now then, to the world Jesus has conducted a miracle. He's been there, they lacked wine, he put water in water pots, he didn't pray. Lo and behold, wine. What is the significance for you and me? What is the significance for the world? What really happened? What is the mystical message? Now some of you are going to be very surprised. I can tell you that right now. Very surprised. <coughs> now in our metaphysical days, we reach the conclusion that Jesus there was showing some kind of a symbolism. And if you happen to be of a certain metaphysical extraction, why there was this color of rosy red of the wine signifying this and so forth. And then the numbers played a great significance. Three meant this and six meant that. And all in all, we were seeing some form of transition This was not a, a mystical message. This was a metaphysical analysis. We're going to scrutinize it word by word. And as we do, please try to see that the purpose of this scrutiny is to establish in you the habit of doing likewise. It was very, very regular for Jesus to speak in parables even when it wasn't labeled a parable. And so the meanings issuing from his words are usually more than two or three. There's a level for John and there's a level for Mary and there's a level for Fred. There's a level for every level of consciousness looking at these words. And so although Orthodoxy will say, well, he performed the miracle. He showed the power of God to make wine. We're going to have to go further than that. We're going to have to see that he was instructing his disciples. 
And if you happen to consider yourself his disciple, he was instructing you. He was speaking a language which was known in the schools of esotericism at that day. You know these wisdom schools. They existed in his day. They existed after his transition. They existed on up to the third century. And in them was taught a truth that was extinguished in about the third century. About three centuries after the crucifixion of Jesus, the message was crucified as well. It wasn't until 1,500 years later, a little more than that, that it became known again, and this time as Christian science, and then unity, and then new thought, and then infinite way. Always, the message was an underground movement. Truth never seems able to come right out because the establishment never seems to want truth. It upsets too many apple carts. Truth is very dangerous. Truth makes people want to live by it. It makes them anything but servants. With truth, a man is a king. Politicians have never wanted man to be a king. And so you see, along about the third century, all those who believed in the true message that was taught by Jesus, they had been branded heretics, burned at the stake or hung or something like that. And finally, the message of Jesus no longer was taught. You couldn't find it on the face of the globe, except in the Bibles and during the great fire of Alexandria, these Bibles were saved. Fortunately, the great scriptures had been translated into Greek. If they hadn't, we'd have lost them. The Aramaic into Greek. And then with the conquering of Greece through Rome, along came this distribution of the Bible. And the only reason it was distributed was because... Rome did not at that time know what it contained. It was just a little fairy story, a nursery rhyme. They never knew that in it was the truth that would be the end of Rome. Now let's see why the words never came direct so that blue was blue and black was black, but rather there was a buzzsaw inside of a chocolate cake. There was truth concealed for those who could find it and for those who would fight it. Why, well, they just didn't know it was there. And so they never fought it, never realizing the deep, great word of God in their midst. Maybe you and I tonight will begin to see a little more of it than we have. It was on the third day now, the third day is the way this begins, and the third day. Now, this is significant right there to see that the third day was implying something which, if you spoke the language of spirit, meant something to you. Try and recall for a moment, if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up again. Try to remember Jonah in the belly of the whale for three days. Three implied that this was going to be the completion of a transition. There was a beginning, there was a middle, and now came the end of it. There was going to be a new development. There was going to be a new level reached. Crucify, resurrect, ascend. Three on the end of the third day. And so, if you were speaking the language, the tongue of spirit, your ears would go up, aha. Uh -huh. This is going to be an important revelation of a new transformation in consciousness. Now, how is it going to be done? On this third day, there was a marriage. And so already we know what was going to happen on this third day. There's going to be a marriage. 
Now, you don't for a moment think that a man and a woman were getting married and that's all that was happening. There was a marriage, to be sure, but it was a union of another sort. This was going to be a very interesting union, and it was going to happen on the third day, and it's going to be called a mystical marriage on this third day of Cana, in Cana of Galilee. Incidentally, Cana was one of the borders of the land that was originally divided up and given to Asher, if that means anything. And now the mother of Jesus was there. Already we're being told something quite significant. A very important development, a union between two things, so important that the mother of Jesus was there. <coughs> what is it going to be? And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Now you know, the disciples being there, this is going to be a teaching. And the marriage, the ostensible marriage, will be a backdrop through which Jesus will show forth a mystical teaching to his disciples. Always, every moment of his life is a teaching. You might say he's always on stage. He always has an audience. His disciples are the audience. He's training them to carry the word so that when he has made a transition, they can go forth with the Holy Ghost and do the same miracles which he demonstrated were within his power and which he demonstrated would be within their power when they too received the Holy Ghost. And now this is their training period. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, they have no wine. I'd like to reset the scene for you this is not a marriage that you have today. This is a marriage in the East in those days. Now then, the picture would be something like this. You would find all the guests are met, and the men, according to their age and their rank in society, would be sitting one by one, squatted, in order. And across the room would be the women in a circle. And that's how it was in those days. Now, the customs of the day were that the bridegroom furnished the food. And that's all he furnished. The custom of the day was that those who came as guests furnished the wine. And they furnished the wine in a very interesting way. One by one, they told the servant, bring some wine. And then the servant would bring wine. And this was the guest's way of paying tribute to the groom and the bride. And now the servants were standing there idly. And Jesus' mother detected it. And she figured it was Jesus' turn. This is on the physical level. And so she said, they have no wine. Now important to notice is that Mary was now turning over her authority to her son. At this moment, Mary the mother was saying to Jesus the son, it's your turn to step forth. Perhaps he didn't recognize it as his turn because she had to say they have no wine, to which he replied what would appear to be a rebuke. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Now, you never spoke to your mother that way. What have I to do with thee? Mine hour has not yet come. Now then, this is a very important line. There are some Bibles, incidentally, that do not say, Mine hour has not yet come. They say, My turn has not yet come. Because in the Aramaic, the word meant hour or turn or time. It was a word called shah. Now then, Jesus, at this point, was not quite sure that he was ready to show forth the power of God 
but Mary was. And she turned to the servants and she said simply, Whatever he saith, do it. This was the final passing of her authority to Jesus. Now you're going to see the importance of that escalation of authority as the miracle continues. Because now Jesus is stepping out from under his mother's skirt. He's stepping out into the world of man to show forth the power of God. He's not rebuking his mother. When he says, what have I to do with thee? He is using the word I to designate that spirit of God in himself. What has the spirit of God got to do with converting or making or bringing wine to these people? Well, anyway, she won't have any of that. It's his turn to step forth. She's pushing him out of the nest. Now let's see what happens. We have Jesus, a religious man, and he's confronted with the need to give wine to the guests. By now you must presume that the guests are rather groggy to begin with, it hardly seems likely that the Spirit of God acting through Jesus would make them groggier. In fact, it was a custom in those days, whenever a religious man was there and it came his turn, he said, well, have water. And so now here's what Jesus does. He asks them to fill the six water pots. These water pots, you know, were the purification water pots. Before a Jew ate, he had to wash his hands, and they had to cook certain, use certain utensils in a certain way. They had to purify them, and these pots were used for that purpose. They were going to be used now for quite a different purpose. They were made of stone. And then all he did was say, now bear the water. And they gave it to the governor of the feast, and lo and behold, he said, this is the most wonderful wine of the day. Now you must catch the deeper truth there of the stone water pots, the water in the water pots, and the wine stone, water, wine. You can see, of course, a firkin being about nine gallons and each of the water pots carrying two or three firkins. We had roughly 27 times six, so about 140, 162 gallons of wine. And you can see they didn't need 162 gallons of wine. Something else was happening. Now, stone is a word which denotes truth. Stone has always been the language of spirit to denote truth at its lowest level. The letter, the rigid, the inflexible truth, such as the truth of your senses, what you see to you is true. And this was the kind of truth designated by stone. Ah, but here's water in the stone. Now what's the significance of water in the stone? We're coming now to a higher form of truth. The stone was solid, the water is fluid. This is flowing truth. This is a higher level of truth a level of truth that man must come into. And as this water rests in the stone for a period of time, it becomes an even greater truth. It becomes living water or wine. In short, Jesus was showing us there 
a transformation within each man that is possible, in fact vital, the transformation from the stone, the letter of truth, to that higher truth, the water, and then to the higher truth, the living waters, the truth of the spirit, here designated as the wine. He was showing this to his disciples so that they may see, so that they might see the necessary transformation that is necessary to attain that which is called mastership, that which is called illumination. There must be a transition in consciousness from stone to water to wine. There must be a transformation, and as the water rests in the stone, it's just the same as if you were contemplating truth. Truth would rest in your mind, and the level of mind contemplating spiritual truth, suddenly there would galvanize an activity within yourself that would lift you up into the wine of spirit. Now this was going to be the path that each individual was to follow in order to attain the realization of the Spirit of God. But that isn't the entire miracle of the water and the wine. The marriage of the mind of man with the spirit that flows within him into the one consciousness which realizes the presence of God, this is there depicted in such a way that you can see the stone as the Pharisee, the rigidly righteous man, and then the water is that individual who can see through the rigidly righteous Pharisee and rise to some degree of truth. Maybe he's now a good man. He wouldn't kill somebody because he killed. He wouldn't stone an adulteress. But now Jesus is not content with us to live on just being better human beings. We must rise into a state which is no longer a mortal state, but into a state of immortality, a state in which we realize that within ourselves is the wine of God the living spirit of God, which he later refers to as drink of my blood, drink of my Christhood. He was lifting us up the ladder of esoteric wisdom into that pinnacle of awareness which is necessary in order to see the great works of God done in our experience. I have something else to tell you about this. I think we'll rest now, have a glass of water. In our intermission, there's some water in the back. We still do not have the meaning of the transformation of water into wine. We've had a preliminary to it, and that's what we hope now to come to. I'd like to take you to the Mount of Transfiguration and to see there that John and James and Peter are privileged to be present at an unusual event, an event 
which at the time it occurs perhaps escapes them in its true meaning. Nonetheless, it was a very necessary part of their experience so that after the crucifixion and the resurrection, they would understand what had happened. Now watch carefully as they are told to open their eyes and they see not Jesus at all. The physical Jesus isn't there, but rather they're looking at light. His raiment was transfigured. They were looking at a different Jesus than the one they knew. They were looking at him who had said, I am the light, and lo and behold, there he was as light. Now, think carefully. What had happened? Do you believe that Jesus had done something to himself so that now he was light? Or do you believe that he had raised the disciples up in consciousness so that they could see him as he was. Now, if you can see that nothing had really happened to him, but rather they, having been lifted in consciousness, were now seeing him as he was, as he proclaimed himself to be, as he proclaimed all men to be, they were now quickened of the spirit and in this quickening they could see truth now let's go back to Cana at Galilee with this in mind and I want you to see that Jesus did not change water into wine but rather did he do something to those who were present so that they found in that water qualities they never knew were there? I warned you there was a shocker. There is no real confirmation of the fact that Jesus changed water to wine. He never said he did. At one time later, when John the Baptist wanted to know if Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ they expected, he said, go tell John what has happened. The hungry are fed and the sick are healed and the dead are raised. He could have said, I changed water to wine too, but he didn't. Now, if you will come back to that feast and see how unlikely it would be for a man of God to take a groggy, half-reeling, festive audience and make wine out of water for them to get drunker. But instead, he very simply said, fill the six water pots with water. And now, when they drank the water, it was they who said, My, this is wonderful wine. It wasn't Jesus. And it wasn't wine. The same experience had occurred there that occurred to Peter, John, and James. They had been lifted, quickened of the Spirit, to see truth. And here... The governor of the feast was quickened of the spirit to see that this was an unusual water. He was drinking the living water. He was perceiving that water for the first time in his life with his soul. And the rest of the guests did likewise. They were quickened. Now then, it's only when you can begin to perceive this inner quickening of the spirit which changes that which is in front of you into something else that you can get the true miracle that happened that day. 
There is in every individual a quality which, when it is brought up, changes that which you would normally experience in the human sphere and changes earth to heaven. That transformation takes place when this quality in you is lifted up and in that lifting of this quality within you, your senses are quickened, your perception is quickened, your inner knower is awake and alive. Instead of seeing with the human eye, you see with the inner vision. Instead of hearing with the outer ear, you hear with the inner ear. Water doesn't change to wine. Nothing changes, but you change. And in your change, the outer changes with your inner change. And you know, someday, as the truth of this becomes known, you're going to see the reason why the Bible tells us how to get rid of cancer how to get rid of every disease on the face of the earth, how to get rid of accidents. You're going to see why in the Bible there is that which removes the appearances which are not present in the kingdom of God. When our father looked at his creation, he pronounced it very good. Do you think for one moment there is a power to change that? His creation is still very good. But we, through our sense perceptions, through that glass darkly of that human mind, we have seen something else. And that something else that we have seen is called this world. As long as the babe remains in the manger, we see this world. But when we are able, like the wise men, to come to this babe with gifts and say, Rise up within me, show me the secret where I can look and drink water and it'll taste like wine. Show me the secret where I can see a leper, but he isn't a leper anymore. Show me the secret where I can look out at those things which appear to be one thing, often evil, and through some magic transformation within me, they no longer are there as evil. The storm is quieted. The multitudes are fed. The inner demons are discarded from the insane mind. It's the same as changing water to wine. It's the finding within of that Christ spirit and then the inner transformation brings about the outer realization of the kingdom of God on earth. I believe this is closer to the meaning of water and wine than we have come in the past. Now, this is the way we must go about studying the Bible. It is not enough to read it as we have done for centuries. It is not enough to memorize it as we have done for centuries. But we must find within it a quintessence, a seed of truth, which, when this becomes a living truth within us, will lead us into a promised land. Now, starting with tonight, it is imperative that we accept the Bible as law and that we face the simple fact that we have been unaware of the nature of that law. You may be sure 
if every one of our ancestors knew the law of the Bible as it was intended, we today wouldn't have a Vietnam. We wouldn't have an overpopulation crisis or an anti-poverty program. We wouldn't know the difference between white, black, red, and yellow any more than our garden knows it. We're all the flowers of all the colors perfectly in harmony. All the birds of all the colors are perfectly in harmony. It has been nothing but a mistranslation of the law. We have, in our superficial way, presumed that Jesus was talking to a sort of a semi-idiot who had to be told, don't kill, don't steal, who had to be lifted into a state of being a very happy and good Boy Scout. We have failed to see that buried within his message was that which liberates us from all of the beliefs which have held us in bondage to fear, disease, death, lack, limitation, there isn't an evil on the face of the earth from which we cannot be released once we have found these seeds of truth, planted them in consciousness, and walk out and live them. Now, how can you obey this law if you don't know it? Why, if you went to England to drive today, you'd have a long time getting used to driving on the other side of the car. And if you went to a country where the signs were in a foreign language, it wouldn't be long before a gendarme or whatever the local police force was was up behind you saying, pull over. You would break the law because you didn't know the law. Your intentions would be great. But in spite of your intentions, you would break the law. And for 2,000 years, mankind has broken the law with the best of intentions in many cases, simply by our ignorance of the fact that here is the living word of God, not a nursery rhyme, not a Peter Grimm's fairy tales, but the word of God presented through the illumined minds of certain men, who in turn say, go forth and do likewise. And you will discover that this living Bible, which you have in your home, is not the end of the Bible by any means. The Bible is meant to live within you and to be freshly received every day. You know, God being the power of creation and the law of creation and the activity of creation didn't leave any stones unturned you may be sure that there is a communication between the Father and the Son. You may be sure that communication system is flawless. You may be sure that it is functioning in you every minute of your life. And you may also be sure that when you learn the art of tuning into it, the Bible will become within you a living daily communion with God. Now this is what's going to come out of a study of the mystical Bible. I'll read you some of the things we hope to discuss. To some of you, they should be well known by now. To some, what is the real immaculate conception? We're going to have to know that. Will there be a second coming of Christ? We're going to have to understand that. What is the Christ mission on earth? Where is God? Where is heaven? Where did Jesus go after ascension? What is the mystical meaning of crucifixion, resurrection, ascension? What did Paul mean when he, said a uh, when he talked of a temple eternal in the heavens? not made with hands. What about Jesus' teaching? Did he teach pre-existence? 
Did he teach reincarnation, transition? When is prayer effective? Where is the divine image and likeness that was created in the image of God called man? Is it the man we see on the street? Or is there a spiritual man we still have to learn to meet? Can you break the law of cause and effect called karma in the East? Is dominion a dream, a promise, or is it attainable? What is the meaning of I am the light? Can you attain a transcendental consciousness? These are some of the subjects we must discuss and we must get them not from your opinion or mine, but from the words of Jesus, Paul, Peter, John. And finally, what is the mission of man? What is the purpose of your life? Are you here for three score and ten? What is the meaning of to know God aright is life eternal? Is it possible for us to reach that state of consciousness in which life eternal for us is a reality? Now these are the things we want to discuss. We're going to stay in the book of John for a while. We're going to discuss the miracles. We're going to try to understand not what the world has seen as a recorded historical fact, but rather that which is being taught to the spirit in man, to raise that spirit up, to dissolve the mortal sense, to lift us into an at one with the Father. Now you may learn something about this silence as you go. Some places call it meditation. And even those of us who have attained some measure of an ability to meditate, to be silent, to be at one with the Father. We all have a long way to go, and you're going to discover that the reason we have a long way to go is that you cannot find the depth of meditation, of silence, of communion with God until you know truth. Truth is the lever. Truth is like a key in the lock. It turns that little something in there and now the door can open. When you go into a silence to listen to your father, if you have not been able first to enter with the key of truth, you'll discover your silence is a meaningless charade. Nothing happens there except a barrenness. But once you are able to spade out the truth, the deep truth, the real truth, that which is called the living waters. You discover this quickens your spirit. And as the spirit is quickened, you have that which was shown in the transfiguration on the mount, that which was shown in the water and the wine. You're lifted higher. You're vibrating at a new rate. And then the incoming light, the outgoing light, there's a meeting at a level which they can mesh. There's no friction. There's no barrier. There's no two levels of light. And suddenly you're one with the light of God. You're illuminated. And lo and behold, you discover that there is no such place as heaven in the far away heaven in tomorrow, 
or heaven in some other place that we haven't yet discovered, you find that heaven is a level of awareness which comes to you when you are lifted into this light. Then you say to yourself, why, this is heaven. This is the kingdom of God. And now I see him as he is. Now I see that which is instead of that which is not. You're going to hear a lot of that is and that is not. Because that which God created is, and that which we, through our senses, have recreated is not. To separate the tares from the wheat, the is from the is not, the truth from the illusion, the kingdom of heaven from this world of earth, that is the purpose of these keys of truth, this law handed down to take you through that narrow place which few can enter, but which the babe can enter because the babe is the way. That babe rising within you says, I am the way. Follow me. I will take you by a way called the Christ, and I will lead you to my Father's house. And as you abide there in the shadow of the Almighty, the fears, the tribulations, the trials, the problems of this world cannot come nigh thy dwelling. And if you believe on these works that I have demonstrated through my Son Jesus, within you I shall do these very same works. This is mystical Bible. It's true of every great scripture in the world, not only of this New Testament, not only of the Old Testament. It's true of the great scriptures of all great religions. If you could see that they are all identical, all revealing the inner spirit which dwells within every man on earth. And when you look at a Buddha, a Jesus, a Lao Tzu, a John, a Paul, a Peter, an Isaiah, you're looking at the Spirit of God made manifest. Why are these men different than us? Do you know any reason? They are only different because they have permitted the Spirit to dwell within them. Oh, you might say they've been chosen. Why are we not chosen? Because we were that busy innkeeper. And those innkeeping days are over for most of us. We have learned that there is a living spirit that walks the face of the earth. And it knocks on the door of every human consciousness and says, let me in. When you learn the secret of opening your consciousness to that spirit, it enters you, it leads you, it guides you, it perfects things that concern you, it appoints you, it ordains you, it initiates you, it takes you into the mansions of the Father. There's not a word that I have to say to you that isn't in your Bible. There's not a word that anyone will ever say to you that hasn't been said through the mystical intervention of Jesus. But now, now we must see there is not merely a physical man or one alone who was chosen, but rather there is one who has accepted the reality of his being and is saying to you, as I have done, you can do likewise. Turn ye, follow me. Where you are seeing water, begin to realize there's something else there. And the reason that something else is there 
is that the Spirit of God is right where that water appears to be. And when that Spirit of God is realized within you, then you're in the living waters, above the firmament as well as below. And then your experience on the human plane is translated into a divine experience while you walk the face of the earth. Then is the Son of Man the Son of God. Then is the Christ risen within you. Now, if you catch that elusive something demonstrated there, you can see that this transforming power is within you. There is within you a power which, when renewed, transforms you from the man of earth to the living Son of God. That power is called a Christ. That Christ was revealed by Buddha, by Lao Tzu, by Jesus, by Krishna, by Shankara. That Christ is revealed by people sitting in this room. People who have attained an awareness of their reality people who can go forth and do likewise, people who can stand in the midst of the storm and say, Peace, be still at his eye. They are in our midst. And this truth beckons to each one of us as we open the inner ear and hear the inner teaching and let the water of our lives be transformed into the wine of spirit. That will be our work for the next ten weeks. We'll end with a quiet a silence, which is really a thank you, Father. Thank you experience is transformed into wine by the realization that the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Our next meetings are going to be in a smaller room. I didn't expect this large a crowd, incidentally. And, uh, and I am hopeful that it will be a very important series for all of you who feel a kinship with this type of message. Thanks very much.